tonight. Um, but let me uh, point you to some reference points so that if you want to get more information, our website is www.nylug.org. We have two mailing lists, the Nylug Talk and the Nylug Announce mailing list. Talk is uh, problem resolution, uh, reasonably high volume mailing list, and the Announce mailing list is one way, but if you subscribe to that, you'll learn about the meetings. And I know that in the last couple months, uh, we've had it's been a little bit short notice, but it's all changing. We've got our next meeting uh, in December on the 12th. Um, it's going to be on virtualization. And uh, we thank Google for providing us with uh, these wonderful refreshments and this space. Uh, and our sponsors here, including uh, Dr. Craig Neville Manning, Chris DeBona, who was a uh, guest speaker not too long ago, director of open source programs, Dan Bentley, also one of our sponsors. Darcy Eglin and Susan Zozoli, John Holly, and Greg Pennington. Um, we've just given out the books, so thanks again to Pearson Prentice Hall and uh, the officers of, of NYLUG, especially Ron Guerin, who's uh, absolutely instrumental here to have so many so many aspects of what we do is passed through and are spawned by Ron, so thank you very much. Um, I want to tell you about the uh, Python workshops taking place every other Tuesday at the Hudson Library at 66 Leroy Street in West Village, 68 o'clock. My next meeting is on the 20th of November. Next Tuesday, yeah, before Thanksgiving. And uh, this is actually a beginner's class. We're talking about uh, learning Python. For those who are thinking about getting into it for the first time, please download the Dive into Python uh, text from diveintopython.org and join that. And uh, Mark, you wanted to website. I received two posts in the last two days from uh, recruiters who had good paying jobs for uh, software development and system people to do with Linux programming work. Um, I said, sure, go ahead, post on the website. Um, that actually gets a lot of posts, you'd be surprised. So go to uh, jobs.nylog.org. Uh, Ruben, did you have an announcement? Yeah. You just set new sunshine for a second.
doing presentation, public relations work, badgering in a good way, you know, any of that stuff is uh, acceptable, setting up tables would be nice, having transportation when we're up there, and interfacing with other clubs and different areas around here, that would be also a good love. And, uh, and what the heck, what else do you have to do at 6.30 on a Thursday afternoon, or a Tuesday afternoon, right? So, drop me well, my email, you can Google me anyway. My name is Ruben Safer. Going at 75,000 hits. It's Ruben at mrbroken.com, Ruben at nylxs.com, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ruben. Ruben at nylxs.com, important conference, freedom-it.org. It is a paradox if you're interested in software security. Uh, there are many entities that don't want you to learn how to become an expert in that field, but uh, let's not just take our freedom for granted. And uh, those personalities, very key and influential, certainly in this group, Richard Stallman, co-author of the General Public License, and Rick Moen, who is the founding member of the Bay Area Linux Users Group that I was part of, who inspired me and others to form this group, uh, important conference in Lake Placid, so I encourage you to check that out. Which is a good segue as well to uh, our speaker. Let me point out, we'll probably go for about an hour here, or uh, 45 minutes, and including Q&A, we want to try and wrap up in about an hour, and then afterwards, let's take our conversations over to the hog pit, which is the watering hole down the block, and we can uh, carry on our, our conversations down there. So uh, let me introduce our speaker uh, from the Software Freedom Law Center, uh, organization and, and law firm here in New York, uh, headed by Evan Moglin, who's the other co-author of the General Public License, which without that document and, and text, we would not be able to develop open source software and be able to share source code uh, the way that we do. Uh, and collaborate together. It's going to discuss the new uh, FOSS legal primer and also a look back on lessons learned with the version 3 of the GPL. So let's with a, uh, give a very warm welcome to counsel James Vesiel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Software Freedom Law Center. Um, raise your hands. Who here knows about the software criminals? Oh, great. So a lot of you know who we are. That's good because as a uh, relatively young organization, we're always excited that people are aware of what we're doing and are excited by what we're doing. Um, we've been around for about two years now, and in those two years, we spent a lot of time trying to help people know that we are the Software Freedom Law Center, a pro bono, nonprofit, law firm. We are pro bono in that we don't charge our clients money for the services that we do. We are funded by grants and public support. Um, we are a non-profit organization in that we are here for the public good, which is why we don't charge money for our clients. And we are a law firm, which, is, which means that all of our activities are directed towards client service, towards the helping of our clients with specific legal problems. Now, what that means is that we're not a general advocacy organization the way the Free Software Foundation is. We're not out there generally pushing just for free software. Now, our mission is to help our clients who make free software solve their legal problems. And so, when I say that we're a law firm, what I mean to say is that if you guys have problems of a legal nature in the world of free software, if you are a free software project, trying to get your code out there through the world, and you have legal problems, you can come to us. We have an email address to help at softwarefreedom.org. You hit that email address, one of us will respond to it. And sometimes it's Dan, sometimes it's me, but usually we'll get back to you in a few days. The kinds of questions we get at help at softwarefreedom.org are all over the map. Because as most of you guys know, if you are a free software project, you look a lot like a small business, right? You are making software and you are distributing it to the world. Now you're not charging money for it, generally. You don't have paid employees, generally. But your enterprise looks a lot more like a small business today than it did 10 years ago. Free software is getting more and more professional every day. Free software is getting more and more respectable, respectable every day. You guys all read the papers. You all know that 
Linux is the next big thing, the current big thing, yesterday's big thing. Linux has risen so fast that now it's almost boring. Free software has risen so fast that no one's really even intrigued by the possibility. They see it all right in front of them. They know what's there. They're not thinking about things that are 10, 20 years off in the future. They're trying to, get, they're trying to gain the benefits of free software right now today. And what that means is that the problems that free software projects are facing are increasingly important. They increasingly matter in the real world. And because people are starting to take more and more of an active role in business through free software and in the world through free software, they're starting to have more and more complex legal problems. A lot of these legal problems look alike. Free software projects come to us. They have the same legal problems every time. I mean, they differ in the details. Sometimes they have bigger problems here than over there. But there is a basic profile of legal problems legal question that every free software project needs to answer. And after a couple of years at the, the law center of working with clients and talking to them about their problems, we decided that what we need is a primer. What we need is the basic first few questions that you guys generally ask us, that you guys generally need to know, the questions you don't even know you should be asking us. What are the initial concerns of any free software project? Things like, what license should I choose? Do I need to worry about trademarks? Do I need to form an entity? What, what, what do I do about taxes? How do I go about raising money? These are all simple problems that every small organization has. Free software organizations are not any different. When you guys produce free software, when you guys create software and want to push it out the door, you all have the very same copyright issues that everyone else has. It's simple software, copyright, licensing. And we as lawyers sort of take this copyright information for granted. We think we know it, everyone knows it, it's the basis of the conversation. But as it turns out, that's not really the case. You guys have educated yourselves in all this copyright law over time. And that took a lot of effort. So in some cases, it took a lot of trial and error. There aren't a lot of really good sources of information out there. And so what we did was we put together, we made a list of all the questions that we get asked over and over and over again. We looked through all the old health emails, trying to figure out who was asking us what and how often. And then we took a first cut at writing really general answers. We took a first cut at writing the answers that we give over the phone when someone says, I don't really know anything. Here's the first, what are the first three things I need to know? And we put it together in a book. And the book, Sure, it has a title, let's see. Illegal Issues Primer for Open Source and Free Software Projects. It's a very boring title, but it has the advantage that it's very descriptive, right? This is a primer of legal issues for free software projects. We are at version one. There's a lot of missing information. There's some typos. We threw it together, we bound it, we want to get it out there. We want to release it fast, and then we're going to update it. I brought a bunch of copies of it with me, and I hope that you will take the copies um, partly because I want to share the information, but mostly because I don't want to carry any of them home. <laughs> so, if you guys want, at the end of my talk, I will stick them on a table, and I hope that uh, there, there should be almost enough for everyone. You can fight over the last ones. We can raffle them. I will preside over a thumb wrestling tournament if you want. But just take them all, please. The primer is our first step at, as an organization, trying to get more and more information out to the general free software community. It's our first initiative at general, wide-scale public education. And we're hoping that it's not the last step. Like I said, the information is a little bit thin. There are lots of licenses we didn't cover. There are lots of questions we didn't cover. There's information in there that is lacking necessary detail. But it is the first crack at, it is the first crack of what we wanted to tell you. And we're going to be putting a version of this up on our website. And we will be updating it as as often as we can with more information. Whenever we have recycled, we will send them here, and you will get the questions you need answered. The flip side of us working on this is that you guys need to bring us the questions you want answered. And that health and software freedom address <clears throat> is exactly how that happens. So once again, I encourage all of you, get us at that address. Let us know what are the questions you need answered, even if they are not questions that 
that you think require direct legal representation. They are general questions of a legal nature where you feel the community as a whole is lacking information. We'd like to be able to fill in that gap a little bit. And we've gotten a lot of general requests for documents on how to do things in the free software world from a legal perspective. And those are the types of questions that we can start to answer. So that's the legal part. That's my spiel on it. Uh, it's an exciting project. I hope that you guys take us up on it and participate. Um, and since the participation from you guys is just asking a lot of questions, I hope that's not too hard. The next thing I want to talk about is GPL version 3. How many people here know about the GPL? I had a feeling. I had a feeling. How many of you guys know that we revamped the GPL? We spent over a year rewriting the GPL, coming up with the new version. Great. How many of you guys have read version 2 of the GPL? <laughs> this gentleman has it on a t-shirt. Have you read that? <laughs> Can you read it in the mirror? <laughs> How many of you guys have read version 3 of the GPL? A few people. How many of you understood version 3 of the GPL? <laughs> Parts of it. A lot of hands went down on that. So, you know, we, we, spent the, we spent the better part of a year marshalling a whole lot of resources to get hundreds of people and groups and companies around the table to discuss what the next version of the GPL is going to look like. I think we did a fairly good job. Of course, we didn't do a perfect job. But the GPL has been out for a little while now. You've all seen it. Most of you, some of you have read it. A couple of you have even understood it. I'm not going to stand here and tell you what's in the GPL. Those of you who are interested, you're welcome to read it. I think what's more interesting than the specific language that got agreed to and ended up in the document is what we can sort of learn from the GPL v3 process. What it is that the GPL accomplished in version 3 and what it didn't accomplish in version 3. Because there's a bunch of things that frankly just aren't doable. There are a bunch of things that a copyright license can't do. And so what I want to talk about now is just where did we succeed, where did we fail, and I'm going to, I'm going to hit that very broadly, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, licensing and community, because I think that's the, the most interesting topic. It's not just what a license is to, but what a community is to. So what is version 3 of the GPL? It is a copyright license. It is also a patent license, and this is new. Those of you who have read GPL version 2 will remember that there's not a lot of talk in it about patents. Right? What does GPL version 2 say about patents? Not much. Nothing, really. And so uh, suddenly, under version 3, we have a whole section that talks about patents. That is an explicit patent grant. If you license something to somebody, a piece of software, under GPL version 3, you are giving them not just permission to read, modify, copy, study, change. You're also giving them permission to use it under patent law. And that is sort of new. Under version 2, the patent grant was implied. Under version 3, the patent grant is explicit. And the reason why the patent grant is explicit is because apparently the implication in version 2 was a little too subtle for some people. There were some people who wanted we wanted it spelled out. And we were happy to do that purely because there were people who were upset about it and we wanted to make people happy. I'm sorry? And those people Well, you can't please everybody. So we have a we have a copyright license and we have a patent license. What we don't have is a trademark license. GPL version 3 is not a trademark license. V2 wasn't a trademark license, V3 isn't a trademark license. And this is in my opinion, a good thing. It's a narrow, it's a narrower license, but in other respects, people get upset about it. Because everyone looks to the GPL to embody all of their hopes and their dreams. They believe that whatever the GPL says is right. That the GPL being a good document, prepared by people they trust, is somehow a source of moral authority. And if the GPL says it's okay, then it's okay. If the GPL says it's wrong, then it's wrong. And frankly, I like that attitude. 
I think that's I think that's helpful in a lot of respect because it helps people have a document to appeal to a constitution in a society. But on the other hand, where we're silent about all these issues, we're silent about trademark issues, and these are issues that free software projects face all the time, but we don't say anything about it. And so we have a vacuum of common agreement and moral authority in the area of what to do about trademarks. What do you do with your trademark when a project forks? To what degree can people who forked your project use the original name of the project? To what degree can they use the original logo of the project? Can they use a modified logo of the project? These are open questions that the GPL doesn't answer. Now, trademark law has something to say about this, but you guys aren't, presumably, you're not experts in trademark law. Your average developer isn't, and there's no central place where people can look at them. And this is something the GPL did not address, will not address. I mean, there's no, there's no plan to re release version 3.1 with a trademark section. It's simply something that we haven't done and we're not going to do. And I, we've seen projects, I'm increasingly getting requests from projects for trademark policies. As projects get bigger and their logos start to get recognizable to some degree. People suddenly want to, want to know what happens when people want to say we're compatible with you and we want to use your logo. And so that's an open question. That's an open question in the GPL. There's, a, there's an answer under trademark law. And I'm happy to, to talk about that if you guys, if you guys want, but I'm not going to go into it now. Yes, sir. Just out of curiosity, as an alternative to putting it into the GPL and therefore forcing anyone who wants to use the GPL to also have that trademark law, Mm -hmm. Why not create like a separate trademark license or something like that that you could use or, or not use? Yeah, that's a really good question. The question was, how come instead of sticking to the GPL, we don't have a separate trademark license? And the answer is largely that the people who wrote the GPL, meaning the FSF and their lawyers, are not people with strong opinions about trademark policy. They're not trademark freedom fighters. They're people who have strong opinions about copyright law, mainly because they have strong opinions about what you can and cannot do with software. They don't have strong opinions about what you can and cannot call that software, or what logos you use with that software. And simply put, there are a wide variety of opinions about trademark law. And so enshrining one opinion in the GPL is probably not going to be the, the thing that, that serves the community best. That's sort of the, you know, the first glimpse at things the GPL couldn't touch because it couldn't touch it. And that gives you a good idea of what the GPL is. It's a copyright license, it's a patent license, it's not a trademark license. But then you also have to look at what is the GPL not. It is a license, it is a set of permissions. If you comply with the conditions for those permissions, you can do all the things the license says you can do, right? The, the permissions are conditional. Basically, the big one is you have to release source code under the GPL, and if you do that, you can take code under the GPL and do whatever you want with it. You can modify it, make derivative works, run it, use it, release it. And so these conditional permissions are the definition of a license. The word license means permissions, license to do something, that's all it means. What, a, what the GPL is not is a contract. And we get this question a lot. People believe that anybody who uses software under the GPL, distributes software under the GPL, owes obligations to their upstream contributors, to the people who gave them the code that they're releasing. And under a contract, that might be true, right? You might have these obligations. Under the GPL, which is a license, you don't. You simply have the permission to distribute or the lack of a permission to distribute. And the way this plays out is that if you distribute code, and it's should, it should be subject to the GPL, right? I take code under the GPL. I make a derivative work. I push it out the door. I don't release source code. Or I release source code but I release it under a proprietary license. Let's say the work is written in PHP. Big I'm sorry? Which is a big I, re I release code 
in PHP, the code contains work that I got from somebody else under the GPL, and I release it under a proprietary license because I don't know what the GPL is, I haven't read it, all I know is I found this code on a new website. And I violated the GPL, right? I violated somebody's GPL rights. It's pretty clear, it's right there in the license. My obligations at that point are not to open my code, to release my code under the GPL. My obligations at that point are either to stop distributing or to start complying. But nobody can come along and force me to GPL my code. And I've seen this in a bunch of communities where people have big fights. They find the code. It's in PHP. And they say, well, this should be subject to the GPL. Therefore, I will GPL it for you. This must have been an oversight. You must have meant to put this under the GPL. Obviously, it's a clerical error. I will slap the GPL on your code and start using it as if it were under the GPL. This is a problem for projects and their communities and how they use the code. It's a lack of clarity in the distinction between a license and a contract. It's not something that we can actually solve within the document. It's not something that we could change. It's just a, it's, it's inherent in the law. And what we've seen from projects is that when they put code out there and they don't communicate with their user base or with other people downstream the obligations of the license, you get these sorts of problems. And this is a failing of the GPL in that people expect the GPL to work one way, right? They expect the GPL to always do the right thing. And when the GPL acts contrary to expectation because they haven't read it, or if they've read it, they didn't understand it, they use the GPL in ways that the GPL wasn't meant to be used. They force people to GPL their code as legally inadvisable and inoperative as that might be. They try to do that. And that's a problem with the complexity of the license. So the GPL is more complex than version 2. As a result of being, it being more complex than version 2, it is harder to understand. And because people have this expectation, they have an expectation that the GPL always does the right thing. They use it incorrectly. And it turns out that the GPL ends up doing the wrong thing. When people don't understand what it means, and they enforce the GPL in ways that aren't valid, they start using the document in ways that it's not meant to be used. Another question. Sure. We theoretically have a version one. I don't. I don't know if anyone's still using it. Yeah. You can use any version of the GPL that you want. Um, you would be well advised to specify which version. If you simply say the GPL, that's pretty vague, then I would suggest you also distribute a copy of the version you want. But you should specify which version you want. A lot of people specify the latest version, or they specify a version number and then say, or later. But yeah, you, you're free to use whatever you want. Any, any version of the code, that, any version of the license that suits your purpose. So here's the problem, right? You've got a, a more complex license. You've got a bunch of people who believe that the license always does the right thing. And the license doesn't always do the right thing. They've confused the license for a constitution, for a definition of their community. And that's, that's sort of the, the next big thing, is that it's not a legal contract. It's also not a social contract. Even though an awful lot of people believe that the license is going to contain the answers to moral questions, is going to tell them what they should or should not do, it turns out that the license is really just the best compromise we could reach on what you can or cannot do. And so when people start looking to legal documents for moral authority, what they get are legal answers and not moral answers. And because people don't read the legal document, 
because they just expect the legal document to always match the moral answer, you get people disagreeing as to what the GPL says. Two people, neither of them has read the GPL. Neither of them understands the GPL. Both of them is sure they know what it says. But because they disagree morally, they believe that each of them is not only right, they each believe that their opinion is grounded in the legal construct of the contract, I'm sorry, of the license. They each believe that their authority is based in the document. And so you get fights within free software communities, within projects, where they're just fighting over what they can and cannot do under the GPL, what's permissible and what's not permissible. And it turns out that nobody ever goes back and looks at the document. I, I get forwarded giant email threads, 15, 20, 30 emails, people going back and forth about what you're allowed to do versus what you're not allowed to do. And nowhere does anyone quote the license. Nowhere does anyone refer to the license. They simply say, this is what the GPL allows you to do. And they're proceeding on that assumption purely because what they began to understand was that the GPL told them what was right. Or rather, the GPL always does the right thing. And once they started thinking that the GPL always does the right thing, well, they know right from wrong. So they don't actually need to read it. If the GPL always does the right thing and I know right from wrong, I always know what the GPL is going to do. And as it turns out, all of those assumptions are false, right? I don't know right from wrong. I don't know what the GPL says. The GPL does not always do the right thing. And so you've got people looking to the license to define the terms of behavior, the acceptable behavior in their communities when they shouldn't be doing that. And what that means is that we've overstated the importance of the license, right? We, we engaged in this year-long process GPL version 3, it's coming, wait for it, it's a summer blockbuster, you're going to love it. We hyped GPL v3. We told everyone it was going to solve a bunch of problems that v2 didn't solve. We went out, you know, I gave a bunch of talks telling people, here it's coming, here it's here, here's what it says. And it turns out that through that process of, of reminding everyone about the GPL and talking about how it's the most successful software license ever, right? More, more programs use the GPL than any other software license around. I mean, that's, that's pretty cool. And we spent a year reminding people how important it was, reminding people that billions of dollars ride on the outcome of this license negotiation. And it turns out that we, we, we might have overstated our case. It turns out that when we told people how important the GPL was, we forgot to remind them that it's really only important in a legal sense. It's really only important as background noise, as the stuff that takes care of your rights and does the things you expect most of the time, but you generally don't need to pay attention to it. You shouldn't be looking to the GPL to tell you how to form rules within your community, to tell you how to behave within your community. Because as it turns out, the only way these legal constructs mean anything is when push comes to shove and we have to enforce them. Well, you might or might not know that GPL enforcement in America, through the legal system, lawyers filing cases in court against other people, is virtually non-existent. GPL's been around. You know, version two was 15 years ago, 16 years ago. And in all that time, we had one, one GPL enforcement lawsuit filed in this country. It was filed a month ago by us. <laughs> so we have, we have a legal construct, the GPL. It's a bunch of legal rules. And they never, ever, get enforced up against the wall. And there's really good reason for that. And the reason is that we generally don't have to. I mean, and the reason we generally don't have to is partly because it's a really good license and everyone knows what it says, but more importantly, it's because you guys know what, it's, know what it says generally, 
agree with it generally, and act accordingly. And when you step out of line, people don't need to smack you with lawsuits. When you step out of line on the GPL, people don't need to sue you. It turns out that all they really need to do is call you up and remind you, is exert some community pressure, is occasionally, and this very, very occasionally, this almost never happens, say, well, I might have to call the FSF. I might have to call the SFLC. It turns out that what really is backing the GPL is the legal system way over there. But on a day-to-day -day basis, it's communities. It's people agreeing. The GPL works this way. We're going to treat it as if we know what it says, and we're all going to act accordingly. And so the license gets enforced, not as a legal document, but as a social idea, as a social agreement as to what proper behavior is with regard to source code. As it turns out, on a day-to-day -day basis, when people want to know what it is that they can and cannot do with GPL code, they don't consult the GPL. They consult their peers. They do what they think is right. And you know they attribute it to the GPL somewhere in the back of their minds. But really, the reason why the GPL is so successful, why there is relatively little GPL violation going on, is because people have internalized the values in the GPL. They decided these are good rules. This is a good way to organize code, to produce code, to share a code. People have decided that the ideals laid out in the document were good enough to turn into common social norms. And so the GPL ends up getting enforced through these common social norms, not through lawsuits, not through people calling each other up and threatening to sue even. I mean, that, do you know how infrequently GPL enforcement comes down to a threat of a lawsuit? Almost never. GPL enforcement, for me, usually looks like this. Hey, we just we noticed that you're distributing some software. We think there's some GPL code in there. We don't see any source code. We should talk about this. Two days, a week later, they bother to call me back. It usually takes about three to four weeks. And then they make a decision. Most of the time, they agree to release the code. It's not that hard. Sometimes. People even call me up to confess. I get phone calls, hey, I, I think we're violating the GPL. <laughs> I mean, these aren't people who are afraid of getting sued. They're afraid of you know, the, the public discontent that would come from, from violating the GPL. Which is why, I mean, if you're afraid of getting sued, you don't call up the opposition and confess. <laughs> if, if what you really want is to comply, what you really want is to not be a violator anymore, you just need some help doing it, yeah, call up the opposition, call me up. That's a really good way to get into compliance. Question in the back. So these type of people who call you up or are having concerns about violating GPL, these are primarily Americans, correct? Do you ever, do you, do you guys see any cases where like in China or in Southeast Asia or in Russia where you're seeing uh, GPL violations used for commercial products and there's no uh, way you know American companies or American entities can act upon them. Well, you know we're the Software Freedom Law Center is an American law firm. Our clients are in America and Europe generally, although they are all over the world. Um, I have some clients in Australia, so we get occasional calls from people in other parts of the world, aside from America. But we are not experts in the laws of other countries. Right? I am not an expert in the laws of England, in the laws of Russia, in the laws of Zaire. I happen to know a little bit about American law. And so when people call us up and they ask us questions about law from other countries, I usually say to them, I have no idea what you're talking about. That sounds like a really interesting question, and it kind of makes me wish that I had, you know, gone to law school in Zaire. <coughs> I didn't. 
so generally speaking, when people call me up with those kinds of questions, I refer them to other other organizations. But the GPL is an international document, right? The GPL is an international document. That's absolutely correct. And the GPL version three is a much more international document than GPL version two, right? GPL version two, there were some concerns, unfounded concerns in my opinion, but there were some concerns that it was not going to be interpreted consistently around the world, that it wasn't going to be enforceable around the world. And we solved it in a very expedient manner. We took all the things, the terms that were specific to American law, and we went up one level of abstraction. So we just started talking about, rather than using the legal terms, we talked about what those terms do, and we gave them new names. So we started referring to them by our terms, and we generalized the language in the license. And our goal was to make sure that it would be enforceable in other countries, and I think we succeeded. So yeah, the GPL, it's an international, it's an international license. You can use it in any country. We did our best to make sure that it had the same effect in other countries as it did in America, and we did that by consulting experts in the laws of other countries. And when people come to us with specific enforcement problems, not being experts in the laws of those countries, all we can do is refer them to those experts. So, there's a question over here. Yeah, have you ever received any call from Microsoft, Cisco, or Novell about whether or not they're violating the GPL? Unfortunately, Microsoft has never called me up to confess that they are violating the license. I think that would be a very interesting conversation. Um, Novell has likewise never called with any professions or has Cisco or any entity that you would recognize. I mean, the vast majority of large organizations respect the GPL. They've got staff that is expert in, in, in complying with the GPL. GPL enforcement is not a problem at the level of IBM and Google. GPL enforcement is a problem at the level of back alley companies, two guys who have mortgaged everything they have to get some product out the door, and they have no time to pay attention to well, anything. They have no time to pay attention to bug fixes, let alone license violations, right? They didn't read the license. They're not violating because they don't like the GPL. They probably never heard of the GPL. They found some code, it did what they needed to do, they downloaded it, they're using it. And a lot of times, people like that, getting them into compliance is just a education problem. So, sure. I'm sorry? Wow, that's a really big question. And yes, what is the process of making money on open source? Um, there's there's an awful lot of there's an awful lot of business models. I'm not going to list them all here, but um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of what's done in the open source world is enabling other sales. It's selling support. Um, some people are making money off of advertising. And for the most part, the most prominent small business model, as opposed to large enterprise business model that I've seen, is selling um, customized versions of free software. So not the actual software, like Microsoft would be software and selling it. Yes, boxing software and selling it is not a uh, free software model that generally is uh, is used. Although some people some people are actually managing. So you've got software, you've got people using software, they're looking to the license, right? They're looking to the license for guidance, they're looking to the license for legal guidance, for moral guidance, and it turns out that moral guidance is a step too far. It turns out that enforcement only happens on the social level. It turns out that the GPL, we overstate its importance, and people look to it for the wrong types of answers. They look to it for moral answers, for social answers, when it really only has legal answers. And they fill in the blanks by themselves. And now I started off by saying this was a problem, but on second thought, it's not that big a problem. Because as it turns out, when people fill in the blanks themselves, the social norms start filling in the blanks, they do a pretty good job. You get pretty good answers. And the only time it doesn't work is when they just disagree about what the GPL says. As long as the norms are truly universal and everyone really does agree about what is right and what is wrong, they can call it the GPL or not. 
It doesn't matter what the source of the authority is. All that matters is that people are agreeing, that they've got norms that work for them, and that they're applying them. So the GPL has this weird, funny role in the free software world. It's a source of ideas, some of which are right and some of which are falsely attributed to it, and it works really well in some instances, instances and it works really poorly in others. And the free software world has attributed a lot of its success to the GPL. And I, you know, I love the GPL, but I do believe that a lot of the success of the free software world cannot be attributed just to the license, but is really attributable. The credit rightly belongs to the communities that have formed around free software. Now the license helps at the margin, but the reason why people get together every day to produce free software is largely because they have communities of people who agree with each other, who have common goals. And sometimes those goals even make them money. But a lot of times those goals are shared values. And those values are articulated not just in the GPL, but in the daily interaction between people. When they, just, when they make common decisions as to what they can and cannot do within their communities. And these values extend way beyond licenses and copyright law. So there's too much emphasis placed on licenses. And not enough emphasis placed on actually looking at who is your community. Because we've looked to the license to make a lot of our decisions for us, we've looked to the license to be a constitution, we've missed out on all the things that a constitution normally does. Right? We've got a limited document, a copyright license, a patent license. But that's not a constitution. A constitution is a thing that actually defines a community, a document that sets out the common goals, that defines who's in the community and who's not in the community. Right? We revamp GPLv3. Who's a stakeholder? Who has a voice? How big a voice? Do we vote? Who gets to make the decision? These are all questions that a constitution would answer, but we don't have answers to those questions. We had to wing it. We had to do the best we could. We just tried to get a license that everyone would be okay, that everyone would find acceptable enough to use by as many people as possible and still protect the core freedoms. So we didn't have a constitution. We don't have a constitution. People treat the GPL as a constitution. It's not, it does a really bad job of that. And so if, you, if you're looking at the free software world, as a lot of people do, and you're trying to figure out what it is that we're doing right, because as everyone knows, we are doing a lot of things right. You're trying to figure out what it is that free software is doing right. Most people key on the license. Whenever anyone wants to know how to do what we're doing in other areas, they always start with licenses. The most famous example is the Creative Commons. The Creative Commons started from a really simple idea. Software freedom works, and we do that with things other than software. A really good idea that can we, co can we copy the success of software in another medium, in another realm? The answer so far appears to be, yeah, you can. People do like the idea of the Creative Commons. And how is that implemented? It was implemented with a bunch of licenses. When Creative Commons got together and decided they were going to try to create freedom in a realm other than software, the first thing they thought of were licenses. The first way they looked to define what they were going to do was licenses. And why is that? It's because in the world of software, the GPL seems to have done a really good job. But as it turns out, the license is not the big piece. The community is the big piece. And the Creative Commons people they created a bunch of really good licenses. People seem to like them. But again, just like the GPL, 
Nobody knows what's in them. How many of you guys have read a Creative Commons license from beginning to end? How many of you understood a Creative Commons license? It's, the, the licenses, first of all, the licenses change very quickly. I mean, they're, they're up to version 3, 3.0 on some of those licenses. And it's only been a few years, right? So you can't keep track of what's in the licenses. Most people have not read them. There's a, there's a case now, a Flickr case. Somebody, a uh, preacher, took a, a picture of a young lady. She was washing a car. I think it was a charity car washing for money, raised money for the, for the church. He put the photos up on Flickr, and he checked the box, because he was a good guy. He wants to share the photos. He checked the box saying, yeah, I license this under Creative Commons. And a cell phone company took this young lady's picture, featured it in an advertisement. Uh, I didn't see the advertisement, but I'm told that she did not come out looking so great in the advertisement. She was upset about it. The preacher ultimately decided that he didn't know what the Creative Commons license had said. When he checked that box, he just was checking the, okay, I want to share. I wasn't giving you permission to make fun of this little girl. I wasn't giving you permission to use this, to use this photo in an ad campaign. I wasn't giving you permission to use this in a commercial matter. But he checked the box, and he had no idea what he was doing. All he knew was Creative Commons is cool. Creative Commons is sharing. Creative Commons is values I like. And so he entered into a, he entered into a legal licensing situation thinking he was entering into a social situation. I'm going to give people permission to use this photo, I wanted, I'm going to share this photo. And he had expectations about what that sharing would consist of. And those expert, expectations were, was that if we're all sharing and we're all being nice to each other, you're going to use this photo in a morally okay way. And by morally okay, it meant in a way he naturally approves of. It never occurred to this guy that somebody was going to take this photo and do with it something that he does not approve of. There was an over-reliance on licensing. We don't yet have community norms that tell us what is and is not OK within the world of sharing non-software items, like media. Sure. Wasn't it less of an over-reliance on it as a misunderstanding of it? Yes, it was a misunderstanding of it. But nobody understands the licenses. Everybody misunderstands the licenses. There isn't anybody out there, I should say nobody, there are very, very few people out there actively sharing works under Creative Commons licenses that really know what all those clauses on page three say. Can I ask you a question about the same license? Sure. How does version three differ from version two? I have no idea. I have no idea how version three differs from version two. I, I have, I've not read version 3 of whatever Creative Commons license was at issue here. Right? The, the question of how GPL version 3 differs from GPL version 2 is a very long. In a situation where a company uses a software to deliver service, its operations not necessarily in selling other software. Software as a service is... Well, not software as a service. GPL version 3 does not differ significantly from GPL version 2 in that respect. If you look at the Affero GPL, that might have something to say with it. The Affero GPL is not final yet, so I don't actually know what that is. So, the, uh, for those of you that don't know, the Affero GPL was a version of GPL version 2. It was, an, it was GPL version 2 with a patch. It was GPL version 2 with a little bit of an additional restriction or requirement, as however you want to look at it. The, the Affero GPL said that if you are going to distribute software 
or rather if you're going to not distribute software, but you're going to rather let people interact with your software over a network, then all your <coughs> obligations to produce source code are triggered. All the same obligations that would be triggered under version 2 if you distribute. And what this did was it said that if you are a company like Google and you have, you write a lot of software, you derive from a lot of GPL software, so your software is subject to the GPL, but you never distribute it. You keep it all on your own servers and you let people interact with your software through a web page, that you have the same obligations as if you had distributed your software to, to your customers. And this is known as software as a service. If instead of delivering software as an executable package for a customer to run on their own box, or a user to run on their own box, if you decide to instead run the software yourself and just make an interface to your software, that if people are interacting with your software in that manner, over a network, you have an obligation to give them source code. It's not something that is in the main body of the GPL. And it is in version 3 only as a, there's, a, there's a reference to it just to say that code released under the Affair GPL is compatible with code released under the regular GPL. Sure. Uh, what is the uh, GPL 36 specifically about uh, DRM use? Uh, GPL v3 has DRM, has has re references to access control mechanisms that obviously don't exist in GPL version 2. GPL version 2 predated the DMCA, um, predates the rise of DRM. Nobody, nobody was really talking about DRM in version 2 to now, so there's nothing in version 2 about DRM. Version 3 talks about, says that if you release software under version 3, you cannot claim the protections of the DMCA. So you can still you know, have DRM software, but when somebody cracks it, you can't um, invoke the DMCA against them. And that's sort of the, the compromise that was reached, that people can still have access control mechanisms. Because as it turns out, some access control mechanisms might be useful. Can a license do that? Can a license uh, tell the user of, of the product that, can, that they're not allowed to do well, it's not, the, it's not telling a user anything. The, the people who are releasing the software, it's the distributor they always who's use making the promises. The person who gets the software and changes it, he isn't set up the stuff for the user. Uh, all he, users. This is a big mistake. If, if the person who is using the software is not also distributing it, they don't really have a lot of obligations under the GPL. Right? The GPL simply says you can use it. It's only when you actually distribute the software and become a distributor that you have a bunch of obligations under the GPL, right? You, when you distribute, you also have to provide source code. When you distribute software. something under the GPL, wherefore you are then a user of the GPL. When you distribute something and under the GPL, you are a distributor under the GPL. When, when you run code, code under the GPL, you are a user under the GPL. So what do you... Uh, okay. What do you... Uh, what's the obligations of software in the GPL, who licenses software in the GPL in terms of the RM specifically. You're saying that I have no idea what you're saying, you're saying that what you're saying is that if they go by code and I created this software with something intended for for with Google Rights Manager, and somebody cracks it, then mm -hmm. I have given up my right under the DMCA under the license. And I asked basically the question, if that's the case, I didn't know that was the case. A license can preclude somebody from giving up what's legally guaranteed them under the government? Yeah, absolutely. Under law? Yeah. Let's see, do I have a copy of the GPL? Yes. I mean, it's, that's a legal question. I'm not just sure it works. Are the words valid? I don't know if I have a copy. The, uh, Who's that law? The license does not specifically mention the DMCA or. No, it mentions access control mechanisms. It mentions access control But so if anybody hacks into my access control mechanisms, I have no, I, I will not sue them under the GPL. No, that's not what it says. If you read, if you read version three, it says no covered work shall be deemed part of an effective technological measure under any applicable law. So, you know, <coughs> fulfilling obligations under Article Eleven 
of the WIPO Copyright Treaty or similar laws prohibiting or restricting circumvention of such measures, which is just a description of the DMCA. And so what it says is that you know, your, your DRM can be DRM, but it, it's not legally an access control mechanism for the purposes of the DMCA. When you distribute software under GPL version 3, you are agreeing that you are not going to consider it to be protected by that section of the DMCA. That's sort of the, the most general way I can put it. Anything to do with the WIPO agreement? Well, it's not, it's not just the WIPO treaty. I mean, it's things that look like the WIPO treaty, right? I mean, when you convey a covered work, you waive any legal power to forbid circumvention of technological measures. To the extent such circumvention is affected by exercising rights under this license with respect to the covered work, and you disclaim any intention to limit operation or modification of the work as a means of enforcing against the work's users your or third party's legal rights to forbid circumvention of technological measures. I have no idea what that means. Um, basically, I know Richard was really worked up about it for about two months. <laughs> much longer than two months. Yes. What that, what that section means. What that section means is that you cannot, you cannot let, you cannot release software under the GPL that contains DRM and then complain about people cracking your DRM under the DMCA. You can certainly complain about it, but invoking the DMCA is the part where where people get hung up. Right? You can't forbid circumvention of your copyright control mechanism. You can still enforce your copyrights, maybe, but you can't use the DMCA. Sure. Uh, everybody talks a lot about GPL3. Is there now also an LGPL3? There is also an LGPL3. And what is in it that's so special? Well, LGPL3 is basically GPL version 3 with an additional permission. It, it's, it's got a permission that lets you link with other software that is not that is not specifically covered by the GPL. When GPL version two and LGPL version two were initially written, they were written as separate licenses. They look very much different. And in order to understand LGPL, you had to actually read a whole lot of language that you didn't care about because all you cared about was this additional permission. And so that has been changed. Now you no longer have to worry about the differences between LGPL. GPL because the differences just basically come down to this one permission. And I think that's that's a very big improvement. We've gone from two licenses essentially to one and then the same license with a small patch. So you've got people using licenses in the world of the Creative Commons. They are using licenses to define the Creative Commons community. And as I said, it turns out that a lot of people don't understand those licenses. In fact, understand them even less than we understand them in the GPL world. It turns out that in the Creative Commons world, there is so much less understanding about it that people are filing lawsuits, that people are getting upset about what happens with Creative Commons um, material, material released under the Creative Commons. And although Creative Commons itself is doing a lot of work to effectuate public education, it takes a very long time to do that. The free software community is rather mature. It's been around for a while. The norms that exist within it took a long time to develop, took a lot of fighting to develop. There were a lot of arguments. There were a lot of disagreements that got settled by public opinion settling out over time. That hasn't happened in the Creative Commons world. And I think one reason why it hasn't happened is because of this over-reliance on licenses. They're trying to define a community with legal constructs that can't possibly define the community. So you've got a lot of people trying to create Creative Commons, the world of the Creative Commons, without any idea of how they're going to go from licenses to community. And that's the most successful attempt at copying what's been done in the free software world into another world. And in fact, things that are not software but look a lot like software, that list is pretty short. The list includes 
other media, other content, you know, movies, songs, writings, poems, things like that. It, when people try to copy the open source model and put it into wholly other worlds, worlds where what you're sharing results in more tangible products, you get even further from the free software model, right? Jim mentioned earlier to me, before, before the talk, he mentioned open source beer. Cola. Cola? Cola. I think, I think there's open source beer as well now. And this is where people are trying to share the recipe. And if they're trying to do that by licensing a recipe freely, I think they've missed the point of sharing. Right? Most recipes are not encumbered by licenses. Most recipes don't come with a list of restrictions on their use and requirements to keep things free. That's not how recipes get shared. The way recipes get shared is, is when people say to their friends, hey, that's, that tastes good. Can I have the recipe? Recipes get shared on social bases, not on legal bases. The rules that govern recipe sharing are really old and well known at this point. People know how to do it. And that's not to say that there's no use for legal constructs in these areas. That's not to say that the license is completely unimportant. But that is to say that if you're going to start trying to copy open source software and import the ideas into open source beer and cola, if you're going to start that effort by trying to write the perfect license, then I think you, you've missed a step. You should be trying to brew the best batch of beer instead. And Jim's going to tell me why I'm wrong. Because licenses, licenses are a great way to begin any endeavor of work that is based on voluntary capital. Work is, is, is created through capital. In the world of contracts and uh, legal lawsuits, that's, there's money involved. Thus, there's a lot of due diligence. That's why uh, you know, you don't you do have contracts. Uh, however, in the world of software interactive software development, where the capital that's being contributed to create the thing is done with people's free time, and that free time does not want to be exploited. Meaning, people don't have incentive to create something uh, with their own free time if they know that someone else, some big corporation, is going to take their stuff and resell it, and they don't get anything back from it. So, it's an excellent model for any kind of thing you're going to produce, whether it's a self-replicating manufacturing system, or it's a home-brewed solar cell, or it's beer, because in each of these cases, the original authors of, say, the beer, uh, don't want Coors to go around and just take that Guarana-based beer and call it Beer Jolt, and sell it and not, and not allow uh, anyone else to make it and have the coolness and the enjoyment that comes from contributing to such a thing. Hey Jim, how do you feel about prenuptial agreements? <laughs> I mean, that's, a, that's an actual, excellent that's not point that people want to be protected by legal constructs. But as it turns out, the legal protections are relatively worthless in the sense that nobody, nobody's using them. That's right? not true. We set the legal protections That's the third time up. you said that, and it's just not true. They become the background challenge for an awful lot of people. Constant conversation with people, get, people get in the position where they think that the legal construct is the most important thing, but usually the most important piece of it is the social construct. The reason people share recipes with their friends is because they all want to share recipes with their friends. And they're not that worried about cores stealing their beer. They're not going to let them... I mean, imagine a world in which the legal construct wasn't there and we couldn't create it. Would people stop sharing recipes with their friends because they're, they're afraid that Coors is going to steal their chocolate chip cookie recipe? Uh, in the case of a self-replicating manufacturing tool, yes, because a large entity with large legal power and lots of capital could prevent grassroots development of such a device because there's so much money to be made and there could be the development of, of legal tools and techniques to prevent that, squash that. That's right. Sue people for creating their own self-replicating free uh, device. So there, there's a, a project called the RepRap project. It is a rapid fabricator. And the goal of the project is to build a rapid fabricator that can build itself. And that sounds like a really cool idea 
It also sounds like the beginning of the reign of the robots. But this project supposedly releases their plans under the GPL. And I say supposedly because, as it turns out, none of them, none of the people involved in this project, not I, except for me, I guess, <laughs> has read the GPL. I mean, they're not, these are not people who have come together because they are protected by the GPL. They have no idea what the obligations of the GPL are. They have no idea what it is that the GPL does for them. They use the GPL because the GPL is the thing you use. They use the GPL because that is what everyone else uses. And they're not at all worried about people stealing their idea. That has never come up in the conversations internally that I've seen, inter not internally, on their mailing list that I have seen. They've never had that discussion. All their discussion is about how they're building things together that they're all going to use to make the world a better place. And, you know, it's true that some people do get protection from the license. A lot of people do get protection from the license. And I don't mean to pretend that the license is unimportant or that the protections of the license legally aren't helping keep people free. All I'm trying to say is that there is an over-reliance on the license to protect people when usually what is happening is that people are protected by the social strictures that prevent them from just stealing ideas or whatever. And, you know, it's not, it's not to say that when you have the license and people are using it that the background radiation of the legal protection isn't serving an important point, isn't serving as a very, very important foundation. All I'm saying is that when you look to form communities, forming a license might be part of that community, but you should pay a lot of attention to the aspects of founding communities that aren't about writing licenses. There are a lot of constitutional problems when you create communities. There are a lot of norms that need to be created that can't possibly ever be contained within a copyright license, within a patent license. The stuff that can be contained within those licenses should be. But the stuff that cannot be contained within those licenses should not just be ignored. Simply starting a community by writing a license and bringing people together under the terms of the license is not actually starting a community. An awful lot of licenses have been written. Some of them have even been good. And they have not actually produced what the GPL has produced because they weren't backed by communities of people collaborating and producing really good work. Yes, sir. How much Larry, Larry Lessig is a lawyer. He has a legal hammer. Everything looks like a legal nail. That might be true. Um, but, you know, Richard Stallman isn't a lawyer. And I don't know if the people who started the open source COLA and the open source year project are lawyers. And the people who started, you know, the RepRap project aren't lawyers. Most people who start these projects aren't lawyers. They, they are not just coming at it from the proposition that I'm a lawyer and so I'm going to use legal tools. I, I believe that they're coming at it from the, the point of view that the GPL created this great community. And I want to create a great community. So I'm going to write something that, that is my GPL. And, you know, I, maybe I've overstated my case. I certainly don't want to pretend that the GPL isn't hugely important and useful. But I do want to say that the GPL isn't all you need, that you need a lot more than that. And you know, even, even lawyers recognize that. Even Larry recognizes that. When he put together Creative Commons, they started out writing a bunch of licenses, but they followed it up with all the kinds of stuff that the FSF followed up the GPL with. A bunch of public education, a bunch of helping people understand why the license what are the values that animate the license? Why do we want to use it? Those are the pieces that bring people together. The GPL, the Creative Commons licenses, are just the beginning of the conversation 
and not the end. Sure. The question was, do I know how many people have switched from version 2 to version 3? And I have no idea. We don't have numbers on that yet. But I imagine we'll be able to look at Linux distributions one year out and you know do some sort of do some sort of text search, right, to figure out what life does Samba look like. I'm oh, sorry? Samba's a big one. Yes, Samba. Samba's a big one. I imagine we'll be able to look at SourceForge a year from now and get some numbers. You know, there's there's not actually widespread audits of what licenses people are using, but we do have some indication of what prior so all the free software foundation projects I don't know if all the free software foundation projects have switched. I, I know that an awful lot of them have, probably most of them, but I don't know if every single one has. It, it might be. I mean, you know, it, it might be that all the Free Software Foundation projects have switched over. I just don't actually have that information. I'm not making a claim one way or the other. Uh, so at the same time, a lot of um, GPL projects are still under uh, V2. A lot of them haven't gone over version 3 yet. Um, one that I've worked on, uh, Rockbox Open Source, uh, Google Box Chromeware, um, mm -hmm. they said that they want to stick with V2 for the time being because for them, V2 offers the benefits that they're looking for and gives them the coverage that they need make sure that they don't, get, uh, they don't get screwed in the end. I'm not sure what screwed in the end means, but you know, there's, there, there are valid reasons for, for selecting licenses. Version 2 and version 3 are not the same license, and I think there are valid reasons for projects to switch, and there are valid reasons for projects not to switch. Sure. Has there been a resolution, or do you, do you know if there thought that a resolution to that case you mentioned? Uh, that Creative Commons, you know, I don't actually know. The, the, Vice President and General Counsel of Creative Commons, um, her name is Virginia. She just she just stepped up to the job uh, about a month ago. So, and I've only talked to her once since then. And I don't actually know what they've done. I know that they farmed it out to a law firm, but yeah, I I don't know. Sir, most technical people don't know I, 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 I am a technical person. I, I guess I'm self loathing in some way. What is the difference between if I write some code and I say I make this code really usable by all and for whatever purpose they like versus me agreeing to any license by any lawyers in any country under any circumstance? I mean, given that you're talking about an internet, international world where Unless you have money and you can go into a legal system, whether it's Russia, America, China, Swahili, whatever that happens to be the case, where you have something to gain or lose. The issue is, I'm not fully understanding what anyone or any company gains by agreeing to, forget about the DRM side, but just if I write code that I can legitimately say is my code, I didn't copy it, I didn't take someone else's code and modify it. Basically, mirror it completely. The judge will say you're copying it. 
you modify it generally 20%, you can say that it's a new work of art. Mm -hmm. Is that same structure for software, if you modify the software 20%, or if you add one line of code to an existing software of a million lines of code, obviously that doesn't change. Well, you know, this is a really interesting question. Where, where is the derivative works line between one piece of software and another piece of software? Um, between a piece of software and something based on the software. And it turns out that copyright law is really unclear on this. Um, in America, there, there is, the language in the statute is, if it's based on your software, it is a derivative work, and therefore subject to your copyright claims. But no one tells you what based on means. <laughs> and there aren't a whole lot of cases that tell us what based on means in the software context. So we've got, We've got a little bit of precedent, and we've got a lot of um, years of enforcing the GPL based on some common agreement about what a derivative work means. And we've got a bunch of industry practice that can tell us what derivative works mean. But to make a long story short, there's no 20% test. There's no numerical test out there. Um, at some point, you can change enough. You can The code can be different enough that it's not based on the original code, but I would guess that changing um, Changing 20% of the code probably wouldn't. And my time is up, so I'm going to keep talking. And <laughs> all I'm going to say is that I I want to thank you all for coming here tonight to listen to my spiel. Um, I hope that you enjoyed my thoughts on the interaction between licenses and communities, and that if you have questions about legal issues and free software, that you do drop us an email, help at softwarefreedom.org. We'd love to uh, help you out with those kinds of issues. So thank you very much. Thanks, huh? So join us uh, next month, December 12th, virtualization. It's going to be a very, very big topic around here. We'll see that very quickly. And any conversations, let's try and bring it over to the hog pit on um, 13th down the road. Primer, if anyone wants what? copies of Oh, okay, give me the other one. Hold on. Could you hold this up in front of the camera, please? You almost forgot about the uh, about the plate. <laughs> you gotta go back for it. No, I'm trying to. Come in. Come in. Come in. Come in. Okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>